We do have a, a, a table with information, including our prospectus and more detailed information on each of the programs that we offer. Um, I would invite you to come and talk to any of of us, um, any any of the members of faculty or staff members that are present tonight, and could I just ask our team member just to indicate by so, so people can see that there are some team members here. Our dean is here, uh, Dr. Rudy Pais, our um, registrar is here, Caroline Devet, Sitska, who is an intern from from uh, not an intern, a, a guest or visiting lecturer and support person from uh, from Holland. She's here. Shireen's here. Rudy's here. I'm here. We've got uh, of our students and and other members of our staff um, willing to share with you what it is that Cornerstone offers. That's the plug. So tonight, as I said, um, is the first because we don't know of any other platform that's been created for discussion of the year report. So um, we, we feel that this is the first tonight. And um, as I indicated, uh, it's really a privilege and honor for me to introduce Rudy Westerweg. We've been working together for well over 20 years now. Um, and um, Rudy had his own company, uh, and still had his own company called The Social Process, which was in, involved in research and working particularly in the local economic development space. And he did a huge amount of work in organizational development. Um, I often brand him as the best organizational development specialist I know. So when uh, um, I arrived at Cornerstone, we needed to crystallize our new direction. Um, uh, that was at the, towards the end of 20. 15 and I invited Rudy to lead that process for us and it was Rudy who steered a process of getting quite a disparate group of people together to in unison say that this institution is about learning and teaching in service of others to advance human dignity and social justice for all and that can just roll off our tongue thanks to the kind of work that Rudy's done in really um, taking an approach that entrenches and, and make really authentic what it is that that it is that we believe in and what it is that we strive toward. So I'm in, incredibly uh, and eternally indebted to Rudy for the work that he continues to uh, to to uh, do here at Cornerstone. Rudy is our innovation partnership and advancements manager. Um, so he takes responsibility for building relationships across uh, a number of uh, sectors so that this organization can in fact become a sustainable organization. Thank you for being here. We appreciate your presence and it's now my honor to hand over to Rudy. I did not need to write um, or do a TV ad for myself. It was just done. So thank you very much, Noel. I, I appreciate that. Uh, and Noel's contribution this evening, Prof, uh, I was saying is the Hair Commission. It's the Hair Commission. And he said, no, 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 it's not the Hair Commission. It's the He, Her Commission. So no hairs tonight, only He, Her. And I've got that right. So thank you. Thank you for that, No. We've got a fantastic panel of people put together for the conversation this evening. Uh, we've only asked them to do this about, uh, in the case of uh, Judge Dennis Davis, we asked him seven days ago. In the case of Jonathan Jansen, we asked him six days ago. And in the case of Anela, we asked her literally through the efforts of um, uh, our, our partner, Alan, J Alan Jansen, two days ago to get involved with this. I just wanted to say thank you to them for that, for getting involved. And, and of course, uh, you know, if you do find Prof's wallet, uh, let us know. Um, I'm going to jump into introducing the panel, and then we're going to go straight to the conversation. I'm not going to do a whole lot of protocol observe stuff. I've got literally got seven lines per person, and Prof's lines are a bit much, so I'm going to cut back slightly on it, seeing that he's got a new post um, at uh, Stellenbosch. <laughs> One liner. Right. That's Prof Jansen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Done. <laughs> So um, this evening, I, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce to you part of our panel, Anela Fezele. Feleza. Uh, Anela is a postgraduate student at the University of Cape Town, currently completing a law degree. Anela has two previous degrees from UCT, a bachelor's in the social sciences, majoring in politics and international relations, and social science honors degree in justice and transformation studies. Aside from previous involvement in contributing uh, research that informed NGOs and the city of Cape Town's decision-making bodies, 
on the reconceptualization of heritage sites in Cape Town. Anela is also currently working for an NGO specializing what I think is a very important conversation, the rights of farm workers. So thank you for that. And Anela is also formed uh, part of various leadership structures within the University of Cape Town in all spheres of residence, academia, and mentorship. Anela was an active participant in the hashtag roads must fall and hashtag fees must fall protest. And just to say to you, uh, when we did the briefing session downstairs, you should have been there because the conversation started and I wanted somebody to get the video in there. And so we said they were going to be a spent force when they get there, so we needed to stop them. And so, so, so you know, the views are varied and substantive. She has also been part of a group that brought about an extension of funding for undergraduate NISFAS students to be funded for postgraduate honors programs in 2018. Thank you, Anela. There is a, a seat there for you. Can we give her a nice round of applause? <laughs> Colleagues, uh, Judge Dennis Davis is a serving judge of the High Court. Uh, he was a member of the Commission of Inquiry into Tax Structures in South Africa, the Cats Commission. And he was a technical advisor to the Constitutional Assembly where the negotiations for South Africa's first interim or rather interim final constitutions were formulated and concluded. He also teaches tax law at the University of Cape Town. And the only reason, uh, Judge, why we asked you to be pegged up with Prof was Prof had a Facebook post last week, Tuesday that says he doesn't know what judges are doing in education. And so we thought we'll invite Prof to come and have this conversation with you. Um, he did qualify it later on that it, it didn't mean you. <laughs> Judge Davis was educated um, at UCT and Cambridge University. He began teaching at UCT in 1977 and was appointed to a personal chair of commercial law. In 1918, in 1989, between 1991 in 1997, he was director of the Center for Applied Legal Studies. Who remembers that one? Okay. Uh, at University of Edwardsland. He held joint appointment at WITS and UCT in 1995 to 1997. He was appointed a judge of the High Court in 1998 and the president of the Competition Commission in 2000. Since his appointment to the bench, he has almost done. He has continued to teach constitutional law and tax law at UCT where he's an honorary professor of law. And finally, he has been a visiting lecturer or professor at the University of Cambridge, Florida, Toronto, and Harvard. Thank you, uh, thank you, Judge. <laughs> so we searched for a profile for him and 17 popped up from different sites and we decided to choose this one. It starts off like this. It says he is described as a public intellectual. Should we leave it there? And also former Vice Chancellor of the University of the Free State, Prof. Jonathan Jansen, has recently been accepted a post at Stellenbosch University. His focus is going to be on uh, research on school governance, management, leadership, and policy. Apart from having served as a fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University in 2016-17, He's also the president of both the South African Institute of Race Relations and the South African Academy of Science. He started his career in, as a biology teacher, no less, in, the Cape Town, in Cape Town after he completed his sciences degree at the University of the Western Cape. Finally, he went on to um, obtain an MS, MS degree from Cornell University and a PhD from Stanford. Prof holds an honorary doctorate from University of Edinburgh, Edinburgh, the University of Vermont, Cleveland, and the State University. Can we welcome Prof. Jan? Thank you very much. Colleagues, thank you. I'm going to allow for some questions from the floor, but I, I thought I'll just, uh, you know, uh, do an opening remark um, on, on, the, on the report and the way that we assembled the team this evening. So uh, there, e there are different views on the report. There are different people supporting the report. There are some people not supporting the report. And I thought I'm not going to talk a lot. I'm going to let the panel start off by just first posing the question to the panelists uh, here that in terms of their perception of the report, what is key? What's not key? What do we have to know? What, do we, what, do, what is important? What is viable? Maybe we can start with you and we can just move around. And remember, this is a conversation this evening. So we're not going to structure or stylize it too much. So, An Anela, there is a, a microphone next to you there in front of you. So what are the key points for you from the report uh, that, you, that you'd like to share with us? Um, well, I think 
one of the biggest key points, or perhaps two, right, is uh, the funding of the TVET institutions and how a majority of the funding is going to be placed in those institutions. And secondly, the proposed plan to have um, students in tertiary institutions fund their studies through loans, access through private banking institutions that the state places itself as surety for in terms of if they cannot pay. Um, I think those two have basically brought about a majority of um, some of the reactions. Um, but the other important point is the first and foremost conclusion in the sense that the report basically outlines that fee-free education is not possible. And I think that statement alone um, can have a lot of adverse effects for different uh, parties involved in the sense that when you say that it's not possible, you're closing off the ideas for further investigation um, in terms of further inquiry to actually make it possible. So you're thwarting uh, transformation efforts in that regard. Um, and um, I think that's, that's very important to note in terms of the effect that it can have. Um, I don't know if I should be expanding on some of this or if I should actually pass. So I'm opening the box, yeah. Just uh, I'm opening the box yeah, for now. Yeah. 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 Uh, Judge, you've got a, a oh. microphone right there. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, th I think it's right that, uh, that probably the most controversial statement depending on which perspective you come from, is the one that we can't afford it. And I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, then, of course, the question is whether you use a loan scheme to turbocharge the possibility of expanding access to tertiary education. I should say, in all honesty, that our tax commission also produced a report. It was, it was produced before her, well, certainly what happened was, basically, it was, it was produced after her produced a, an interim report that said nothing, and we wanted to give the minister some guidance because uh, we thought that he should know a little bit about this so that perhaps we could do more than we're doing at present. We started off from the proposition that much more should be done, but simply to have a scheme where up to 125,000 rand you can get into university, but not after that. It was outrageous because everybody, I'm sure everybody in this room would realize that if you're earning that amount of money, I don't know how you, say 130,000 or 200,000, how you sponsor students into university. It's impossible. Uh, but I do want to say in all honesty, we came to the conclusion that it wasn't feasible at this moment to have higher education uh, free. And in one minute, I'll tell you why. Um, and we, we came to that conclusion, I should tell you, um, in, in early 2016, when the economy wasn't even as bad as it is now. Uh, we came to that conclusion because we couldn't see how we could find between 40 to 60 billion in addition to what, what was there on the table, precisely because at that point um, there, were, there are, and there were, and there still are, competing demands. And you've got to ask yourself, where do you want to put your money? Is it in healthcare? Is it in housing? Is it in infrastructure? Is it in? There's no question it should be in progressive causes to redistribute. There's no question about that. But is higher education the one you want to put it all into? And secondly, I should say that one of the most difficult situations we've got now, and we can put this on the table, is if we were to now do what the president was suggesting, an extra 40 billion on top of where we are, that would give us a hole in our revenue of 90 billion because everybody knows that we're 50 billion short of what we budgeted for. If that's the case, it's likely in any event that we're going to be downgraded on Friday. That'll add another 30 billion onto interest charges. So we'll now have 120 billion to find. And so what we've really got to have is a serious debate about what our priorities are. Um, and maybe the Hair Commission actually's report, and even our report, allows us to actually have that sensible debate about what the priorities are. I'm not suggesting that the priority shouldn't be, say, tertiary, but I am saying that's a, you can't just assert it without, without justifying why that has a higher priority than others or where we to find the money from. So that's my opening statement. Well, thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, thank you think of the panelists, I'm probably the only person who works in education as a, 
Do you mind switching it on, Prof? Sorry, man. As a day-to-day -day activity, you know, so I work in early childhood, I work in preschool education, I work in primary and high school education, and of course I work in university education. I can tell you now, higher education should not be the priority for funding as an education person, not as a politician, as an education person. I would put all the money, or the majority of the money that we have in the education budget in preschool education. Why? Because the research is uh, unequivocal on this matter, that when the gap opens up between a kid who went to a really good preschool and a kid who didn't, you never catch up. That's why you find kids who can't do math. And so we get this math literacy rubbish, you know, to keep them happy. But every child can do mathematics if the foundations of education. 58% of our children, I don't know if you know this, uh, cannot read meaningfully. That is, they don't understand what they're reading in grade four. 58%, okay? So in a rational system, you don't put all your financial eggs in the higher education basket. You put the balance of your, 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 your money in the foundation years of schooling. Why? Because we now know that 500,000 kids drop out between grades 1 and 12. Five and that's half a million. Okay? So I would rather make sure more children are able to participate in schooling. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to money, it is about making choices, as Dennis correctly says. Okay? I'm not even talking housing here and welfare. I'm just talking education. Just stick with education. The problem is four-year-olds don't jump over the gates of parliament. Okay? And so they cannot make the demands that 18-year-olds or 20-year-olds make in the higher education system. But it will be the end of us, I tell you now, from an educational point of view, for the majority of poor children. I was outside of Manzum Toti last week. I was in a class with 160 children in one class with a math teacher on the other side of the room and the temperature that I measured inside the class was 40 degrees. Okay, now make the choice. Do you go after the noise politically or do you go where the need is? Now, if we were a super wealthy country, we don't need this debate. You just spread the money across the system. Let me just say one more thing by way of introduction. I do believe that every child, every not child in this case, every student who is poor and talented and cannot afford our education should study for free. About that, I'm clear. But that's not true for my children. That shouldn't be true for your children. Okay, I don't know Nelly well enough. <laughs> okay, they, my children should pay, just like I paid, by the way, from a bursary, so that other people's children can study in perpetuity, uh, and so on. So, on the fact that we cannot afford it for everybody, that is so obvious to me. The fact that poor students must get free higher education without the burden of paying back when they get a job, that's also clear to me. So, so Anella. Uh the question about viability, judge making the point about uh, money is a key issue. Uh, Prof is saying maybe there are other priorities. How quickly does the conversation become a pitting of positions? It very quickly pits positions against each other because assuming that when we say we need more money for higher education does not negate how important primary education is. Um, and to say that we have to kind of decide between the two is problematic because at the end of the day, yes, we do need literal people, right? We need people to be able to write, to read, to develop a, a skill set that essentially allows them to be competent in a university atmosphere. But the problem is, is that the majority of the country's population now is expanding and it's in the youth. And so the viability of our economy, the viability of productivity, the viability of how we advance um, in how the country develops will rest in the hands of the youth. And the problem from then on relates to employment, right? In the sense that if you're developing people and you're developing these skill sets, obviously it's going to be the use or the function of something. But if people do not have these kind of degrees that give them the access to contribute to that larger circle, then that's a problem. That creates a problem of unemployment, right? Which is a huge problem in the country. And so by not opening the doors to education and allowing people to develop skill sets that actually allow them to also be globally competitive in terms of their skill sets, um, we, we, 
we are floating, we are kind of getting into a cycle where we still end up with the same issues that we're facing today with regards to what do we actually do with the youth and how do we best develop the youth to actually make an impact on the country, to grow the economy and to change the status quo of the issues that we're facing now. To judge, given Anela's point, is the question about the deficit, they're not rather an investment than a deficit. Well, of, co of course, look, the parts that are absolutely right. I mean, um, if you're going to develop an economy such as South Africa, let's just start there. The one thing I can show you of, it's not going to come through manufacturing anymore. Because what's happened in the world is that levels of productivity are exceeding, not in South Africa, but worldwide, are exceeding demand for goods. So you have to look for services. You have to look outside of the manufacturing box, and it's absolutely true. The knowledge economy is absolutely critical to that. So I accept that readily. That, that means a number of things, by the way. It also means giving a hell of a lot more money to universities for research purposes. Uh, which, by the way, we've been underfunding. Uh, Jonathan knows much better than I do, but I mean, certainly from my understanding, um, you know, that, 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 that's really clear too. The real question is, where do you put your priorities a at this moment in time? So if you say to me, um, well, uh, you've just jolly well got to find the money for tertiary education, put the 40 or 50 billion on, on, on top, because at the end of the day, it'll work out Right, you'll get growth at some point in time. Well, you know, as 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 John Maynard Keynes said, in the long run we're all dead. You know, what I mean by that is that that if we started that tomorrow, if you if tomorrow morning we announced the forty to fifty billion um, uh, increase because we put all our money into the tertiary education system, there are a few things that arise there. Firstly, why should my children I'm not going to talk about yours, Jonathan, but I will talk about mine because I that's the one I think why should pay. I think, I think we should all pay. I think that middle class people over a certain level have to pay in a country which doesn't have the resources, number one. Number two, um, I think that, that, that the question you have to ask yourself is, if you're going to spend the 40, 50 billion, what's going to happen to social grants? What's going to happen to really poor people? What's going to happen to housing? You have a retrogressive policy, it's disastrous. So the real starting point should certainly be, yes, we need a knowledge economy. Yes, we need to have better tertiary education. And yes, it's scandalous uh, that people who are talented enough to be at university should be anxious about the fact that they can't get in because they can't afford to pay. But on the other hand, just to show the complexity, it's even more scandalous that we've got 58% of children who can't understand what they're reading. I think that's a crime against humanity. And I seriously mean that. I've said this often. I think we are perpetuating a crime against humanity amongst children who are never, ever going to succeed in this society at all. Because So the question is, where do you then, where do you actually prioritize? Now, there are a number of things we could be doing. And I would want, you know, I, I think we're missing a number of tricks. Um, certainly the anger, and it was an understandable anger which I understand perfectly about the fact that people who really are desperate and should be at universities are, are feeling the pinch. But then, you know, we've made choices in this country. Let me give you one. We've chosen corruption. Let's be honest about it. We have chosen corruption. Everyone in this room knows the level of corruption that's taking place in South Africa. I mean, I can tell you conservatively that I think the Guptas alone probably have taken about 200 billion out of this country, illegally. We know, for example, that every year between 50 to 60 billion is unauthorized expenditure which the, which the Auditor General tells us about. We have chosen a course of corruption. So I'm saying we could do a hell of a lot better but then this, our focus has got to be a lot more nuanced than it is at present. The simple point is we can't have corruption and free higher education at the same time. We simply can't. And I'm not even sure if we didn't have corruption whether we could, but I sure as hell we could make a better crack than we are at present. Talk, talking about the better cracker, Prof, is university leadership doing the best it can given the conditions that they are and given the reports and recommendations? I, you know, having been a vice chancellor for seven years, I, I never understood why VCs were the target of anything, you know. At a personal level, I give away 
to this day, half of my salary to students who can't afford higher education. I don't say that because I need applause. I say that because having grown up on the Cape Flats and having dropped out of university, I know what it means to not have food and to not have money to travel to Belleville. I know what that means, okay? But that's not a systemic solution to anything. I can give as much as I can, but it doesn't solve any uh, problem. By the way, one young man, I just want to say this because I'm extremely proud, uh, one young man that I sponsored uh, from Oscar Petter in Nyanga called me two weeks ago just to say he won the Mandela Road Scholarship and I'm uh, I mean it's just extremely uh, grateful you know uh, for for this young man but that's one person you know in a system with over one million uh, young people studying for higher education so here's the problem okay let's cut through all this crap here's the problem it actually doesn't matter what this report says there's only two things that matter politically. What is the president going to do? And what are the activist students going to do? Which is a small minority of the total student body, but nevertheless a, a very, as we've seen, a very powerful minority. Okay? What the president wants to do, I firmly believe, is to take the populist route for political reasons and make the announcement that there will be free higher education for everyone. If we do that, I'm telling you now, the fiscus collapses. It's over. Okay? And you will will be worse than Zimbabwe in that regard. If the president does that, um, university management will, for the next 20, 30 years, be playing uh, defense, okay, with regard to student activism. Uh, it's because there's no money. There really is no money. I was just to laugh when students told me at university assemblies, oh, you're hiding away 50 billion. If I had 50 billion, I said to them, you won't, you won't have to pay a cent. There is no money. Okay, UCT might have, be our best research university, but I tell you, I've looked at their financial statements. There's not a lot of money to go around. Most of their money is actually research money that is dependent on you doing specific things as opposed to, you know, recurrent costs. The president doesn't understand the concept of recurrent costs. You can put 40 billion in tomorrow morning, but you're going to do it again and again and again, okay, <laughs> in a system that's expanding. So what matters is what the president says. And secondly, what matters is what the student, that small activist group, says. What a, a faction within the student activist group wants is free higher education for everyone. Now, first of all, that is really ridiculous. Let me tell you why. The research shows very clearly in the economics of education, if you did that, you broaden, you widen the inequalities. That is the rich kid from bishops, okay, uh, then has even a greater advantage than the poor kid from Nyanga or Mannenberg. It's a fact, empirically. So you can't have free higher education across the board, okay, in a country with one of the highest Gaini coefficients in the world. So what needs to be done sensibly is to say, those who can afford to pay must pay. Those who can afford to pay, but not, but it's a bit of a burden, there is relief so that you're able to pay back and so on and so forth. Like the two teachers in a family, I used to see this a lot, who have got four kids at university. You can't with two teacher salaries, okay? And that those who can't afford to pay, which is a lot of the kids, make that education free without any payback requirement, okay? Have a stratified system like that and the problem goes away. But that must be managed politically. Before I throw to the audience, a judge, there's a proposal there at the end, the tail end of Prof. Sir. Across the state. There wasn't far away from what we were that what we said, and let me just explain what we try to do. There are there are a series of things you can do variables. Um, we try to see how much could we actually add, how much could we could we squeeze out of the system without the sort of disastrous fiscal consequences. And Jonathan's actually correct. I assure you that if we go for the forty billion now, we go the way of Zimbabwe. There is no doubt about it, and I'll tell you why we do. Because it's all very well telling me that growth is going to come. Because consider this, you get downgraded, you're 50 billion already short of what you're being able to collect. That's apart from the fact that you've got a deficit of over 3% of your GDP. To be non-technical about it, you, you get to a point whereby your borrowing costs go up so high that even if you keep on increasing taxes, your interest costs go higher than your, than your tax that you can collect, and therefore you simply print money, inflation goes higher, your social grants collapse, and there's massive poverty in the rural areas of an unspeakable kind. And we should remember this, with all the criticism we have of this government, we have the best tax and transfer policy in the developing world, meaning our genie would be much worse 
if we didn't have the tax and transfer social grants, etc. So they would be under serious jeopardy. So what we say is, okay, can we find an extra 15 or 20 billion? I'm not sure we can now, but we thought we could then, okay? And I agree with Jonathan. That would mean that we would want to take out a much higher group. I think it's unbelievably unfair for people below a certain level to have to worry about paying. They can't, they can't make it. Then we've got to start thinking of some staggering proposals until we get to a point where people can genuinely pay it. That's not satisfactory. I accept that that might not make Anela very happy. I appreciate that's not going to make many of the students who talk to me all the time very happy. But I keep on saying to them, we're not living in a perfect world. We have no money under the mattress. And we've got, a, we've got competing claims. And I think there are, there are imaginative things we can do. I mean, I know that one of the things that happens in America with loan schemes is that if you take a loan scheme and then you go and work in the public sector or in a human rights organization or something like that, you get the whole salary, you get your whole loan taken away. In other words, it doesn't pay it back. You can do a whole range of imaginative things. But the one thing we cannot do is simply say tomorrow morning, everybody in South Africa has a free tertiary education. So, so Anela, it sounds like the judge and prof is beginning to stratify this idea of the students. It's very difficult because, I mean, um, Judge Dennis Davis is very correct to point out the issue of corruption in the country. The very reason why the state has chosen private banking institutions to bring about these loans is because the state itself cannot administer it through its own institutions because it's either so corruption ridden, they don't have the manpower or they don't have the expertise. Right? So that points to an issue in the state, a lack in the state that needs to be paid attention to. But what I want to make a point about here is that a mismanagement of funds does not equate to an absence of funds. And the problem here is that the funds are being mismanaged, but actually there's not enough engagement with where the funds actually lie. And the funds in this country lie within the private sector. The private sector actually holds a majority of this economy. And this report essentially goes on to further place the burden of developing the student's skill set and funding the education again on the state and again on the very same graduates who are already burdened with issues of generational you know debt and it's an issue it's an issue that needs to be tackled um, and the private sector has been mum about this i mean the interim report actually reflects that they've received lots of submissions from NGOs, from interested parties, from higher education um, parties, but it actually explicitly mentions that there was limited engagement with banks and resource-rich companies. Now, that's very interesting because the state has entrusted its whole other plan and suggestions in these very same banking institutions that it had limited engagement with, and that's a problem, right? Because at the end of the day, a bank is a business. The bottom line matters. Right? And so the willingness to accept it on their part means that they need to have some kind of surety in the sense that if they add these interest rates, they'll be paid. So for them, they're highly untransformed in the agenda of funding education and what that actually means for the country. It's about the bottom line for the banks. And to show that the, 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 the private sector actually has this money, um, I don't know, Equal Education recently also um, submitted a report on some of the workings of the NSFAS CEO, uh, Masana, I think is his surname. And in that report and some of the workings, while it has been you know, purported that NSFAS is highly inefficient in some of um, the delivery of its objectives, with the help of private institutions and private businesses, they raised over 100 million rand in four months. Now, that is, that is some serious money that could actually go into the funding process of funding um, graduates. This money doesn't even come from a point of view of bursaries. They have separate bursary programs that they run, that they try to get students involved in. So to actually point out and to say that the state itself does not have money, I think the state is running away from the conversation that it needs to have with the private sector. And it's deviating. And using the banks as a means to administer 
these kind of loans is a get out of jail free card mm. because it's not actually compelling itself to develop the institutions that it needs to facilitate these kind of funds without incurring the kind of interest that would further dampen the economy if we were to implement this. Thank, thanks, Anina. So, so while, pro, while judges, uh, thank you. While, while judges formulating his response that 100 million rand is a lot of money, I'm going to ask uh, some in the audience to either make a comment or pose a question. Uh, thank you. One over there, and then one over there, and then we'll take it on from the um, from the from the panel. Thank you very much. If you can just introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Nabagazi. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, um, our, our guy must hold the microphone, man. Uh, you can't give it to you because we're recording it, and so we yes. must hold on to the microphone. Don't mind. Okay, my name is Nawalazi. I'm also an academic. Um, I want to go back to this idea of lower education, as in uh, G, E, E, T, before we get to tertiary. What we need to appreciate in South Africa is that government essentially has spent a lot of money, a lot of money on school education. That is why we have those good numbers at grade R. Because government throws money at things. And one other aspect that we need to take into account is that our children, when they go home with homework, their parents don't help them. Because of those literacy rates that we want those graduates, when they have children, to do homework with their children. They have casual jobs. They don't have medical aids. They work at ShopRite. They take the taxi with their child to the suburbs so the child can go to San Susi while they go and clean at a house. Those are the realities of people who are fighting for education in the lives of their children. We come from a generation of roads must fall at Forte University in the 1960s, where our parents couldn't finish their degrees, but they became the greatest entrepreneurs. It's about attitude. Those corrupt funds belong here. Let's get that tax and the tax we want to get with Africa and that tax that leaves Bait Bridge every month. Let's get that back and put it into education. Thank you very much. At the back there, thank you. Back up again. Thank you. This is in 1994 around neo trade liberalization. Um, deregulation of capital, pri uh, privatization. So, in a way, we live in the consequences of that. And so, it is, for me, it's wrong to have the conversation about trade-offs. And, and Michael Sachs was at UCT last year sometime, having that very much, con that same conversation that he's resigned now. Because already, the whole ed pub education and public education specifically is in a mess. I mean, public schools, parents are having to pay up to 6,000 a year. I mean, for me, in the horrible days of apartheid, at Garlander High, school fees was 12 rand a year. I don't even think people needed to pay. But so, so yeah, the, 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 the thing is that we're dealing with um, a government that is corrupt, but also a set of policy choices that led us there. So I agree with Anelia when she says there is tons of capital surplus. Government is outsourcing res their responsibility to the private sector. They should be collecting corporate taxes, which they lowered since apartheid. There is a debate about the wealth tax. And so partly we also need to push for a competent and accountable government. Because there is no trade-offs at the moment. The whole education system is a mess. And so we must rather be talking about where can we get this money and then how can we redistribute it in a way so that we have efficient education systems. I'm not as smart as, as many of you in the room, but I do think I know a little bit about how schools work and why they don't work. And it's not because of money. Okay? The primary reason our schools don't work is because the money given to those schools is not used well. It's called internal efficiency in economic terms. That's the reality. Um, the, the fact that every day in a South African school, township school, there are five teachers absent every day for various reasons, that tells you you have a crisis. A country that made bad policy choices, the countries that made bad policy choices, all, all around us, but they have better education, school systems. Let me just talk about school systems. Much better. Mozambique, much better. Zimbabwe, much better. 
Okay, that's not a money problem. That is an efficiency problem. The money we have isn't really working. Where the money should go is in preschool education. That was my earlier point. Okay, now this is important to note because South Africans have this notion that if you only put in more and more and more money, you have more justice. That's not true. Now you and I can have a long debate about the neoliberal state. It doesn't change the fact that tomorrow morning we're still going to make these schools work and these universities function. Okay? So I'm sort of, I don't know if it's a, co a consequence of aging like with this decolonization debate where I hear things that sound so ridiculous, you know, but it's a handy weapon in, uh, for an angry person. So you don't have to deal with the fact that uh, decolonization has a long intellectual ancestry. You don't have to deal with that because it's a hammer that you use on every nail. Uh, uh, you know, and so on. So, no, our problem here is, let me be very clear, <clears throat> our problem here, especially in schools, is that we've allowed Satyra to run the schools, we've allowed the government to abrogate its responsibility towards teachers and, and learners, and that is why the schools don't work, okay? Putting more money into it in and of itself solves nothing, unless it's preschool education. So, <clears throat> um, you still have to make choices, unless you overthrow the state, which I don't think is a bad idea, but you still have to make choices, okay? Um, and those choices are choices under great constraint, and so on. Let me also say this, this notion that there's money somewhere, guys, get real, please, okay? The private sector operates on a very different logic from the states. So this is how the private sector works, right now as we speak. The private sector says we already give a lot of money to education, which is true, by the way. Okay. Secondly, we don't see any returns on that investment because, as Anali correctly said, they work on a, uh, you know, on a very straightforward uh, financial logic. Do you know what a lot of them are doing right now? Is taking their money out. They're going offshore because they're nervous about what they see in the political economy of South Africa and they're also very nervous about what they see in the education system. And when that happens, you and I can have great debates on the neoliberal state, it's over. Okay? And that is why I believe that what we're staring down at the moment, with all these fancy debates, is a university system that I believe is going to become increasingly mass-based, poor quality, like the TVETs. Okay? with no culture, no intellectual culture, because to talk and to have a view and to dissent is apparently wrong, and your top professors leave. There's still not a week that goes by where I don't write for it, an A or B rated scholar, a letter of reference because they want to get out of the system. Now you know where this movie played off before? In Senegal, in Tanzania, in Zimbabwe, in Uganda. Okay, and the reason I came back into this country over and over again, despite temptation, is because I believe Africa must have strong universities, but we're not going to have strong universities when our arguments are so much focused on the past, okay, and not so much attuned to the future and to the realities that we sit with in an economy that is screwed. Well, while we move there, we must remember the issue about the TV colleges and now getting in this report. But, by the way, that's a stupid decision. Here must really, that's why I said judges mustn't do this kind of thing. Did you, s not, not, not judges who teach uh, in, in, in universities, you an academic who happens to be a judge. A you you who said it to, already. Uh, he's a bowler who happens to bat, you know. Um, uh, um, um, think of this. Where did the political pressure come from? I mean, I'm thinking now as somebody, as a political science major, where did the pressure come from? TVETs? No, it came from universities. So you sort out the problem with the universities. Now you make TVET a NISFAS project, and you make IC, the income contingent loans, you know, a university project. I see I mean, I, I mean, there's just no political common sense in this thing. So it does sound that the TV high education conversation is beginning to come onto the class conversations in a way, Judge? Well, okay, I mean, there are a number of things. I, I, if just to reiterate something that Johnson started with, uh, I should remember at a, at a talk I heard him give recently in, when he inaugurated his new book, Critique of Black Reason, made the point to a lot of people who were making sort of similar comments, I don't know where you people come from, he said, but you don't come from Africa. Because if you did come from Africa, you'd understand the history of African universities, which is exactly what you're talking about. The utter destruction of African universities, which was a great tragedy. His point is, it's not what must fall, it's what must rise. And, and he's saying, 
The challenge is not to destroy the damn things, but it's to reconstruct them. And my worry is exactly Jonathan's worry, because I'm now writing all sorts of letters from people all over South African universities who are going overseas. We are going to actually have a decline in our university standards. The second thing we need to bear in mind, and I, I'd be interested in Jonathan's view on this too, because I noticed the Auditor General, I think it was the Auditor General, made a statement that we've got too many students at universities. That he, that he said there were a whole lot of students. He made a, about 200,000 students, he said, shouldn't be there. And in fact, if we had this, we could probably afford far better for the poor ones who should be there. I, I don't know how valid that is. That's because the universities themselves and the is over-registered. Yes, it's possible. I'm, no, no, I, I'm not going to deny what you're saying. I'm, yeah, I, don't, I don't want... Yeah. Yeah. That's why money goes Yes. No, I accept that. Well, I, I accept that, but the, 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 but the real proposition is whether we still have to debate that issue about how many we've got and how much we can afford. But but the but the but the much more central proposition too. Did we make the wrong choices at the time? Yes, many of us argued that we did. But there's no point now. I mean, that we can't reverse what happened 23 years ago. That's absurd. What we, I think it is true that neoliberalism is dead. That, that uh, it, it's created dreadful, pernicious consequences like Donald Trump and Brexit and lunatics in Europe. Um, that's true. But I think it is possible to sort of reimagine an economy which would actually work for 55 million people. I do think, and of course, I'm also bearing in mind uh, another factor. We've got to be clear about the fact that when universities, if we have less people at universities or more, it doesn't matter, what we would have <coughs> is a university that doesn't, in fact, work where the best chance of your success depends on your parents' success. That's the crucial question if we're going to have an egalitarian society, is how do we reimagine a university community where it's not just because my parents actually were wealthy or my parents had qualifications, because that reproduces the pernicious past. So we have to think that through. And, and, and what I'm saying is that's a debate we should be having. Now, we can't have that debate with respect if we're going to start talking you know, about money questions that just make no sense. So let me just give you a couple of points. It's all very well telling me that the private sector is going to give 100, another 100 million. Maybe they can give 10 times that, 15 times that. But the pri to ask the private sector, okay, we can't afford in the government, uh, but by the way, where does the government get its money from? It does actually get its money from the private sector because it gets from taxpayers. So, so where's this 40 billion each year? It's not just one year, each year going to come from, right? It's not going to come from the private sector as such. I mean, they're not going to dish out 40 billion because if they were sought to dish out 40 billion, um, my view is that they would leave in increasing numbers, and we're already seeing that, and then you get a spiraling economy. Let me give you a few statistics to explain what I mean. Corporate tax at 28% at the moment brings in about 180 billion. If you shove that up to 43, you have 44%, like another a 50% increase. You may get 40 billion, but you won't get 40 billion because, in fact, they'd be more aggressive in terms of tax evasion and many of them would leave. Secondly, most African countries are now reducing their tax rates. So people then go ahead and get quartered in other African countries. It's, it's not a question that I agree with that. I'm just telling you that's the reality. Thirdly, if you say you want a wealth tax, sure, we're working on that right now. But I can tell you <laughs> that a wealth tax, if we do really well, will bring in no more than 10 billion. To give you an illustration of what I'm talking about, if we increased maximum marginal rates of tax of individuals from 42% to 60%, how much money do you think we would get each year? I ask anybody in the room, give me a guess. 1.5 billion. Any office above 1.5 billion? We'll probably get 7. Hmm? That's at 60%. So what I'm trying to say to you is, you know, with respect, there isn't money sloshing around of the kind we're talking about. And it's incredibly irresponsible to say that there is, because then you're promising people things that you cannot deliver upon. So my own view for what it's worth is, we have to have some tough choices again. And those tough choices depend on reimagining an economy and, in a sense, ensuring, and, I, and I, my priority would be to ensure that those kids who are deserving of going to university and cannot afford, there we have to find the money. But that's a manageable project. 
which is possible. Thank you. Anila, I just want to make two points before you go. Yes. So the idea that neoliberalism is the hammer, and are you using it in this case? And the, and the other idea that there is no money. You know, I actually am going to deviate from the structure that you've set for me here because I think at this point in the conversation, the gloves need to come off. <coughs> Firstly, in telling us that we cannot include discourse about decolonial efforts, you are entirely without focus as to why we need transformation in the first place. Movements made in decolonial efforts bring about the narratives as to why we have generational issues now, as to why we have generational issues that relate to our curriculum, relate to um, you know the kind of research that we do and the pedagogies that inform that research. Right? We cannot discuss a transformation agenda without considering the levels of trauma and systemic inequality that the country has been through from colonialization to apartheid to now. Right? It's actually impossible. And also it informs the narrative of justice, essentially. How do we frame our understanding of justice and what that means? And what people should be getting back from, you know, the kinds of things that were experienced in that time period if we don't talk about these things? Right? And so we cannot look at the Fees Must Fall movement in isolation. Fees Must Fall was informed by Roads Must Fall. And Roads Must Fall was a decolonial project. Right? And it brought about these narratives of alienation, not only in terms of history and representation, but also in terms of finances. Black people, people of color in this country have been alienated from participating in the economy for such a long time that we're now stuck with this issue of how we fund higher education. Right? It comes from a history. And so we cannot ignore that issue, firstly. Secondly, for private institutions to say that they do not benefit from funding higher education, I think that is a misrepresenta misrepresentation of the benefits they receive. First of all, Private institutions, whenever they fund students, whenever they give donations and charities, whenever they give towards a university, that goes towards taxation benefits, right? In the sense that that company gets taxation benefits and gets taxed less. Secondly, it's free advertising. Because if you advertise within that space and you put up your logos and you put up um, a, a lab that you, people can use, those very same students begin to psychologically aspire to work for your corporation because your corporation is in their face all the time, right? It's a psychological thing, right? But also, they benefit from the labor. If they, in, if they invest in students that are in higher education situations, they benefit from those graduates. They benefit all the time. And so to say that we must be worried about scaring the private sector off into different African countries is false because there are different dynamics and there's reasons why they aren't investing in other African countries and they chose South Africa in the first place. Other African countries don't have the kind of security and legislation that protects them the way that South Africa does. There's a lot of information about that, right? Secondly, I'd like to address the issue of the TVCs. Um, you're very right. You see, the thing is about TVCs is that unlike you, universities that are specialized in the development of skill sets that are highly academic, TVET institutions actually deal with artisanal expertise, right? And so we cannot polarize the job market into only academia and specialists. We need graduates from TVET colleges, right? And we need to fund them because a lot of the money that has gone towards higher education has actually been thrown into universities and TVET colleges and institutions have actually been neglected by the state previously. Not to mention the justice component in the fact that a majority of the people that comprise of these colleges are people of color, again. So if we do not invest in the youth that particularly have an intersecting um, oppression of not only finances, but access to the job market, then essentially the, the state is screwing itself over, right? Because we need to do that. But now, the difficulty about this is that with the state throwing a majority of its funds in TVET colleges, um, 
creates an issue for the fact that we're going to move a lot of potential graduates in tertiary institutions in TVET colleges because of the fact that it's actually financially viable and it's affordable. People want the means to survive. People want the means to make a life for themselves. But also, people are dealing with black tax, which means that my parents gave everything that they had to my education. Right? Our parents aren't the kind of parents that have exorbitant trusts and the exorbitant pension funds where they can retire at 50 and be on a cruise ship for the rest of their lives. They invest in their children because the, the expectation is that we take that money back and that we support them and we support the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of graduates are dealing with. They're dealing with black tax, essentially. They're burdened with the responsibility of having to take care of their family whilst trying to establish themselves in a career sense, right? So that's generational debt. That's, the, that's an issue here, right? But now, I think in, in engaging with, you know, funding the TVET colleges, um, Professor Janssen might be right in the sense that the conversation started with higher education. But does that mean that we should exclude all other educational institutions? I don't think that's a fair argument to make. Um, and also, in terms of the criticisms that have been offered by this, um, EFF's Mbuyeseni Lozi has actually stated that if you fund um, a majority of your higher education funding into TV, into colleges, right, it creates a classist um, lineation in the sense that um, only a certain amount of people or a certain group of people or a certain class of people attend those institutions, right? And essentially that means that you alienate a lot of potential black graduates from actually became, becoming um, expertise in a certain sector merely because they're going where they can be um, you know, accredited in terms of a degree because they can afford it there, right? And so then essentially that maintains a system of oppression because then, um, you know, black people are not able to participate in areas of academic expertise that right. are in higher education right. situations right. as well. Right. So, so while you formulate your questions, I'm just going to give Prof uh, an opportunity just to respond directly. It's the kettle, don't worry about it, we're just making some coffee. <laughs> Look, I think the, um, I mean some of, quite a bit of what uh, Dennis said and Anneli said is, is agreeable. I mean, there's nothing, so we mustn't create a conflict here that doesn't exist. Um, secondly, I, my, my life is not sequestered in universities, it's in schools and it's in TVETs. I do more TVET work than I really know, so to say I'm excluding by virtue of argument is simply uh, uh, misleading. Um, my problem with TVETs is that it is still a stigma among black students and families because of the association historically between working with your hands, unfairly so, because I don't think they just work with their hands, but working with your hands and that being the thing that black people do as opposed to getting university degrees. That's our problem. How do you change that? You know, the the equivalent there is trying to convince a black parent to, to send their kids to study high school in indigenous languages. I've not met one parent that's told me that, okay? Because you know the social structure uh, and power, uh, how it's organized in society. So TVETs must get attention and TVETs need, but the TVET attention is not more money. The TVET attention is changing the culture of the institutions which is anti-intellectual, I can tell you that as somebody who works in TVETs. And secondly, they don't have the infrastructure of a Germany to make sure that you get top quality infrastructure for automotive engineering, for example. They don't have that. You know, one or two have them, but they don't have that. So this problem is a little bit more complex. And that as is, by the way, Anneli, my, my argument on decolonization, I've studied this all my life, so it's not really simply saying, you know, it's, uh, it needs attention. Of course it does, but that's, that's another debate. So I, I think here's my big problem with South Africa, okay? Every time I leave the country and I come back, I realize we're stuck. And the reason we're stuck is our entire public discourse is about corrective knowledge. It's a past, the past, the past, the past. And I must hear another speech, to me, by the way, you know, struggled under apartheid about the terrible past by somebody who didn't struggle under apartheid, then I am, you know, going to blow a fuse. Mm -hmm. Social justice doesn't only lie in correcting the past, it also lies in positioning yourself for the future. In other countries, children learn to code. 
Okay. In other countries, children are now learning uh, the, the uh, uh, neuroscience, uh, uh, automation, artificial intelligence. Yeah, we're stuck trying to figure out what to do with a dead man, white man's statue, and whether, as in the demands of one university group, you know, whether edible condoms should replace the government issued condoms, and, and so on and so forth. And I think this notion of constantly looking in the rear view mirror without asking how do you give young people, we're going to miss out. Black kids in this country are going to miss out on the fourth industrial revolution because we're so bloody obsessed, okay? with correcting something in the past, which we should, by the way, at the expense of positioning ourselves for the future. So I sit in the Silicon Valley for 10 months, and what do I see? I see that the people dominating the Google campus are not Africans. It's not us. It's Indian software engineers. Because they're positioning themselves for the future, and that, let me be clear, is a social justice issue, not simply an engineering or technology issue. Two minutes before we go to... Yes, yes, I, I, I want to just make two points. As I said earlier, it is about reimagining the future. Now, people of my age certainly don't be reminded about the past, or alternatively, that, that what Anela says is absolutely right. Of course, people have been traumatized, people have been oppressed, people have been denied their basic dignity, the vast majority of the population. So, of course, the trick is how we do bridge between corrective action and imagining a future. But I'm absolutely convinced of this. A couple of things. One is that black children deserve a decent education at universities. I want my students to have a better education than I had. I don't want them to have a worse one. I'm very fearful of that. I really do. I, they deserve better than I had. And, and I'm worried about that. The second thing is I'm not worried about the debate about the decolonization debate. As l <laughs> the question is what it means, and that we can debate. I do think that I've written for the past 25 years of my life complaining bitterly about what in law was certainly a very Eurocentric conception of, of uh, education. I'm absolutely convinced that we need to give people more voice. So let me give you an illustration, if I can, just for things. I've just been finishing marking of my jurisprudence essays um, this term, my students. And half of it, well, I gave them two choices, but I won't go into the second one. The first one was, you're appointed to the Department of Private Law at the University of Cape Town, and you're asked to teach either contract uh, law, the property law, or delict law. You can choose whichever you are. How would you design the curriculum? in the light of the theoretical discussions that we've spent in the classroom. I was actually stunned just how good so many of those essays were. You know, I, they were really excellent. And what I'm trying to say is, of course, part of the education is giving people voice. Voices that they own, not voices that are imposed upon them. So I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't want to be, you know, when, when Jonathan talks about this, but it's always dangerous that we get boxed into corners uh, to have disagreements when actually there's much of what we're agreeing to. And it seems to me the kind of debates we should be having is how we can actually start from a kind of common basis. Because all of these concerns that Anela have been raising, I'm, 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 I'm concerned about myself. But then the question rises, how do we imagine a future where in a sense those children who come from poor schools and come from backgrounds with all the trauma that you've been speaking correctly about actually get the kind of education that, that is critical. One final point. I find it interesting when you start, and you were right to say this, <coughs> it's a question of how we're going to compete in a global world. This is a cruel world out there. This is not just a question of us retreating into some kind of xenophobic myopia of South Africa. This is the question of how our future generations are going to compete with those kind of fancy computer scientists in, that you're talking about in Silicon Valley, etc. And so there's a massive impetus for us to think about when we debate these questions of decolonization, we debate this question of the transformation of universities, how do we position ourselves to, in a sense, kind of reflect our past, give voice to it, but in a sense imagine a future that works for 55 million people? And frankly, I don't think we're having that debate in this country properly. Prof. Karolis, are we having that debate? Any, anybody from there? Thank you, over there, and then over there, and then number three. I'm just taking three for now. I, I just want to say from a process point of view, we've got half an hour left. 
So I do want you to begin to articulate some of the question sets in relation to the report itself and some positioning, and then for the panel to be, begin to prepare their sort of five, six minutes closing arguments for me. Thank you. Hi, my name is Megan, and I work in higher education. My worry or concern, my worry or concern is about the notion of wraparound support, funding, and the role of higher education. Um, I work on a project at the moment where we look at student success. So it's not only funding of students' fees, um, it's also looking at funding the accommodation, at meals, at transport. That's besides psychosocial support, medicine. And we talk about medicine, it's, it's usually psychiatrist and, 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 med and psychiatric medicine. And it's putting a lot of burden on the university itself. So then you get this disjuncture between the academics and management and, and a bigger, and we're not having a discussion about that, about the young people that's coming into our system who requires additional support besides your tutoring and your mentoring. Um, so it's not just about fees. Thanks. I didn't see that actually any of the recommendations report Fascinating. I work on a project now that, that uh, looks at that type of thing. Um, and they're hoping to uh, up, upscale it. And it's frightening to think that that's going to happen. Um, because we get a lot of young people that come into the system with trauma. Um, they come, in, for example, to UCT. They come from a rural village in Pumalanga. Um, they're far away from their family. They got A's all their life. And they come into this foreign environment and they don't have any friends. And that adds so many other burdens. So, yeah, thanks. I think I was here and then at the back. I'm not going to comment. I, I will ask the question later on with regards to the sustainability and how the president wishes to exit. But with reference to my learned friend here, I think Prof made a, a comment about uh, universities turning into, what was the word, social... There was a particular word in one of your articles, I was trying to find it here, yeah, that eventually universities end up being social grants, welfare. So perhaps, no, I just wanted to comment on that. Yeah, the name's Enrico. I'm just a concerned community member. So I, I want to suggest that um, maybe the focus needs to be shifted more in the systemic stuff. And as an example, for instance, if we're trying to find remedy like this report was trying to do, within the existing, for instance, financial system, it's essentially shifting deck chairs on the Titanic. So how do you look at that? And should the, the discussion not be more around the fact that should we really be aspiring to artificial intelligence when 80% of our population is, is subjected to poverty and they don't know where their next meal is coming from? So in the context, we never really had the opportunity post-1990 to truly engage as a nation about what are our priorities. And we are totally divorced from the reality of what our communities are being confronted with on a daily basis. It's bread and butter issues that we are not paying any attention to. So at the cornerstone of all to, <laughs> to to coin a phrase, you know, the existing, the existing financial system perpetuates exploitation. And, and I think more of the discussion and, and, and the debate needs to be around where our focus of attention needs, needs to be. At the back and then now we end up. I'll take another round of questions. I have a little bit of time. I'm just looking at the reimagining of the future. Um, there's no doubt that the issues are very complex. Um, but I think that in our country, there's forever the issue of skill shortage and knowledge um, impairment. And because of that, we have implementation problems. And I think possibly how we can resolve this is by saying to our students if they reach that point, and I want to take issue with the fact that we shouldn't have free education without paying back. There should be payment, but not necessarily in monetary um, value. But we should pay back to society. 
So possibly after graduation, our students should be given that opportunity as like, for example, an internship. And it shouldn't just merely be in the medical field. It should be all over. So that students should be given an opportunity to apply skills, develop more, and at the same time, um, contribute to the country, but also learn and earn a salary. And hopefully by that, contributing and, contributing and paying back. And that is just my a question which might appear quite simplistic but you know from listening it seems like the greatest fear is that people are going to leave okay and I want to know genuinely want to know where are they going to run to and is the grass really green on the other side I, I just wanted to add a question to that Prof Judge and then, uh, to what extent is this conversation if it sounds a little bit like a uh, a clash of ideologies that aren't necessarily in agreement on the modalities of funding. Because it, it does feel, as we move to the end in the next half an hour, I'm worried about the idea of a common ground, around a common ground of ideas and where people can share. And Prof saying, is there an artificial conflict here? It doesn't really exist. Yeah? Prof? Obviously, we have different views on things, and, and I, I don't like things being put down to generational issues. I have debates with my children all the time, and they're smarter than me, and we often reach common ground on, on the economy and stuff like that. So, uh, I think what we need to do is, uh, this is a South African problem. We are skilled in the lang what Henry Giroux called the language of critique. You put a number of South Africans, particularly black South Africans like myself, in a room, we're good at critiquing. The moment, so when the brother there says, you know, the existing financial system exploits the situation, I said, okay, what do you do with that? Nothing. Nothing. The new liberal state, what do you do with that? Nothing. Short of a revolution, which would be nice. Those are words, okay? At the end of the day, you've got to deal with the reality in front of you uh, every single day. And that reality is we have an unequal system that is, that racially privileges a few, that uh, economically privileges uh, even 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 in fewer and we've got to deal with that so that's for me as an activist today that's what I need to deal with okay and language of critique in and of itself does nothing for you you have to sort of say what is again going to Giroud the language of possibility so Dennis, what, what, how do you move how do you move forward on on all of this. I completely by the way the way, the way I use welfareization in my book is not that it's a bad thing I think universities do have a responsibility in a country like ours to do more than just uh, offer free tuition. And I love projects. I just sat with the REAP people, the Rural Education Access Program, which does that. It provides mentorship attached to uh, tuition and accommodation fees. We don't have a choice. We've got to do that. But to constantly portray ourselves as victims of some great evil past is not good enough for me. This is where I miss Steve Biko. This is where I miss the notion that I'm not a bloody victim. Okay, and that nothing you can say to me will demean me as a human being, as a black person. Okay, we've lost that. I, okay, I think Zimbabwe's poverty, rural poverty is worse than ours. I work there. Let me tell you something. They still give us more actuarial scientists per capita out of their school system than any other uh, country in SADC. Because they don't sit down and portray themselves as these perpetual victims of their colonial past. And that's the difference. And my fear for South Africa is we're now moving into a situation, and that's why the lady at the back is absolutely correct, in which unless you give me something and you give it to me for free, which is actually never free because somebody always pays, okay, I'm going to burn down something. No, fuck it. I think we're better than that. I think we're prouder than that. And I think that this is something, and also to reduce black people or black students simply to angry people is also ridiculous. We're also intellectual people. We can figure out our way out of these dilemmas and, and so on. So we, I, I, I'm tired of these debates in which all we do is brandish our weapons as opposed to sort of saying, how do we think ourselves out of this? This is how the new unity movement, which I was a great supporter of, went, went to nowhere. They forgot that you've got to use more than language, okay, enabled in, in transforming the, uh, the system. So what do we do here? It's just make the system more efficient. If every student who comes into university actually passes and gets to degree on time, the savings from that, okay, is so substantial that you're able to get more students into the system. But because, as you know, more than 50% of students don't make it to degree on time, 
more than half drop out in the very first year of study. In economic terms, that is a huge loss. So in addition to getting money from the outside, we also have to ask the question, how do we use our money on the inside better? And I don't think we're doing a good job in that regard. Now, unfortunately, I do have another point that I did explain to know. So Nelly and, and David, uh, uh, what's your name again? Uh, Dennis, if, if you could forgive me. Yes, you two know each other. Prof, would you stay for three, four minutes for Nelly's response? Would you mind? I'm going to have coffee with Anale, and oh. I'm not going to be late for my next meeting <laughs> oh, because you invited me at the last minute. Can we give him a round of applause? Thank you very, thank you very much. Okay. Um, respectability politics, I normally wait for the elder to exit the room. <laughs> um, okay, to answer the first question um, about the, the report and the inclusion of other um, finances that go into the student experience. The interim report actually mentions that when we say we're funding fees, we're funding not only tuition, but we're funding accommodation, we're funding transportation, we're funding, um, you know, potentially even meals and um, books and tools that are used by the students, right? So the definition is almost all inclusive, but the difficulty here is that it actually makes no mention of funding um, health services for students, right? Which is a very big issue because if you think about how many rounds of protests that we've had, a lot of students are actually suffering psycho psychologically. I mean, that's why there have been so many suicides at UCT this past year, right? Students are very triggered. Students are very traumatized. And when you think about the, the, the services that are available to the students, I mean, you only have campus wellness facilities, but that campus wellness facility is meant to cater for everybody. And when you think about just how many qualified psychologists they actually have on call, it's less than actually you can count on your hand for that volume of students, which means that a majority of people either end up on the waiting list and are never seen, or because people are trying to process people so fast that they don't actually get to the crux of people's issues and they don't get classified as serious cases. And that has been, that has been discovered in some of the students who've committed suicide this year, that they were found to have either been on the waiting list or have been classified as not being serious enough to actually psychologically evaluate, right? So that is an issue and the report actually doesn't make accommodation for that. Um, and I think in our discussions about how we transform and how we better um, students and how we accommodate that, I think the, psy the psyche of how these kind of conversations have affected students on a very personal level because, and I, that's the thing, it's not emphasized, all of these oppressions are personal. They're personal. And so it, it's, it hits students at a, at a different level that really isn't articulated and needs to be discussed. So you're very right to bring up that point. Um, on the second issue, um, so you mentioned that perhaps we need to shift um, the, the, the focus perhaps to this, the systemic agenda, right? And fixing that first. Um, and I, I think perhaps you're right. Um, my, my, my proposition would be that we definitely need to do that, but like uh, Judge Dennis Davis has said here, we actually need to work on the advancement and being able to compete at the same time. And it's a difficult task. Um, when you mentioned that, I'm reminded of um, something in Professor Crane Sudin's writing that has stuck with me since my first year when I read it. And he creates this, this imagery and he says that um, when you say to a black student, go out, go compete in the world, this is the story that kind of plays out. He says that it's almost like taking one child in a room, putting them in darkness, no windows, no light, blindfolded, and all the other children outside get to play. And then one day, you remove this canvas, or you open this door, right? Which essentially, in South Africa's case, would be the transition to democracy, right? You say, well, now you're free. Go play with the other children. And the child gets there, and firstly, they don't even know. They didn't even know that other children existed and could do so much. But secondly, they don't know the rules to all the games that are being played. So first, they need to learn human interaction. They need to learn how to be able to relate to other people in those environments. Then they need to learn the rules of the game before they can actually play that expertise. But now the difficulty of the modern time is that 
we have a deficit in social spending that was created by the replacement of the RDP uh, pro uh, program with gear, right? And the, the, the uh, International Monetary Fund that forced South Africa to actually renege its responsibilities with social spending because it took a loan, because apartheid bankrupted the system in the beginning of democracy, right? And so the problem then with that is that there's a consistent need to play this balancing act of how do we correct the past and how do we compete at the same time. Um, so you're definitely right that it should be a starting point. Addressing inequality is definitely a huge issue as to why we're experiencing the problems we are experiencing today. But it's also important for us to keep up with the times in technological advancement. Unfortunately, African states are also burdened with the fact that we are resource-rich countries, which means that in comparison to countries like India, where their pharmaceuticals and their technology are on par, South Africa's investments largely come from resources, right? Our minerals, our mining, our land, and our workforce. That's why a lot of international companies actually come to South Africa, because they know that we are cheaper labor, right? And so the difficulty about that is that as much as we want to advance, the place where the money comes in, the demand where the money comes in, comes from our resources. And it continues to imprison us in the cycle of not being able to compete in other means. Right? And that's a difficulty that we actually have to acknowledge. Um, uh, also, on the point of, um, I don't know, sorry, I didn't get your name. Um, you mentioned that perhaps we can pay back in other ways. Um, other states have actually showed that this is plausible. In certain countries, like for instance, Nigeria, um, certain parts of Nigeria, when people graduate, they actually have to do, I don't know if it's a year or two of community service solely without being employed and just giving back to the community, right? And that really aids in doing a lot of community development. But the problem here is, is that if we're talking about funding people and funding higher education, that means that there's a deficit that's been created in order to fund somebody. Because although the education might be free for the individual, the cost has come from somewhere else. Sure. So, essentially we need to consistently do a balancing act of how to maintain the economy and not actually implode into a crisis and a suggestion has actually been made and proposed by an accounting lecturer I think uh, Kanyiso I'm really sorry I'm getting his name wrong um, but he proposed graduate tax in the sense that if you graduate from an institution and you are within a certain uh, bracket of income, that you would be given a graduate tax, that tax would then be collected and directly fed back into the system to allow other people to be funded. Mm. Now, it's very difficult because there's opposing views to this, right? Some people in the movement, other students are actually willing and they say, if fees must fall was about creating access and we are dedicated to the ideology of this movement, then we are willing to forego that tax. The downside of this is that people who are already burdened with generational debt already have a, an addition onto that with the generational tax, right? So there's a balancing interest here that's very difficult to consider with regards to the, the effects of that. And lastly, just to speak to the issue of um, a brain drain. You know, whenever South Africa is in some form of a revolutionary movement, there's always the threat of, I'm going to leave. I'm going to Australia. I'm going wherever. And um, my views on this are slightly radical, but uh, my response to that is let them go. Because the people who say that they want to leave are basing their decisions on a self-projection, right? In the sense that this is not it's not financially vi viable for me, right? I'm not getting the salary that I need, or I'm not, you know, publishing the kind of research that I need to, my name is not getting out there, or this is too much for me personally to handle, right? But then there's no real consideration of the fact of how your skills can actually be used to empower other students to become competent in certain areas, which means that the person's agenda is not transformative in the first place. Secondly, if the person leaves, then that means we have more space for other people to rise, for other people to become professionals, <laughs> other people to actually take that position 
and to do better in, in, in that position. And the people who have stayed are people who are also committed to the decolonial project. The people who have stayed are the people who are committed to issues of transformation and how they can use their skills to better empower the students that are currently there. So while, yes, there is a, there is a controversial argument here that I'm making about brain drain, mm -hmm. and it's a reality, right? It's a reality that expertise will leave, especially if they've been giving uh, better offers somewhere in international universities that give them more professional acclaim. We still need to make space for new yeah. people to take up the market. Mm -hmm. Let them go. So, so voluntary exiling, Pro. I don't know where to start because I, you know, it's just like <laughs> in the, the middle. The last, the last point. I mean, it's patently ridiculous. I mean, the truth about it is that that I don't want people to leave. But the fact is, when you do have a brand drain, and we've had one consistently, it has a massive effect on your growth, and it has a massive effect on <coughs> a whole range of things. But the bottom line is, no, you don't want those people to go. You want those people to empower others. Yeah, frankly, if there were all these people lurking around in the in the uh, uh, around here, could actually take these jobs, it would happen. It's not happening. So, really, at the end of the day, you know, we're part of a global world. We need to understand that. Secondly, frankly, it was no IMF loan. I don't know where you get that from. It's complete nonsense. The, what was true, what was true, was in Becky actually did shut down the RDP, and Bernie Fanroff, who we know well, will tell you that that they they were told this literally without any without any announcement. And the reason was because Mbeki was obsessed by a kind of neoliberal economics. That's a choice we made. It was not imposed upon us by the IMF. It was a choice we made, and we should know our history. It was a wrong choice, a very wrong choice. Yeah. There's no let, let, IMF. Let's give the judge an opportunity. Uh, Anila, let, Sorry, let, no, let's give him an opportunity. You can come oh, back okay. later oh. to the point. But, 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 but it's irrelevant anyway, because it was a choice we made. I mean, <laughs> I think that the question of the kind of your point about changing the economy, well, yes, of course we need to reimagine an economy, but but with respect, the question of 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 the changing of an economy is an economy that actually is going to produce four or five percent growth rates, not in order to be exclusive, but to be inclusive. We can do what we like at a half a percent growth rate, but we are actually stuffed. And we will get increasing unemployment and increasing immiseration. You only have to look at Zimbabwe to realize that. Although, oddly enough, I think they could turn their country around quicker than we can because of their skills and their education, which does go to the point about focusing on education. But the point I'm simply making is that, that you know, if you look at the decolonization debate, which I've tried to indicate I think is really important, it's extraordinary when you look at all the iconic decolonization theorists, from Biko to, to Walter Rodney to Stuart Hall to Chabal, all of them, Fanon, all of them actually had an idea of a counter-narrative of what a, what a society would look like. That's the debate we've got to have. No good shouting down. It's a question of what you put up. And, and so I'm perfectly happy to debate with you, sir, the question of what kind of economy we have to have. But the fact of the matter is that in the 21st century, where manufacturing has gone down in every single country in the world and is not going to recover, Donald Trump's crap about bringing back jobs to America is never going to happen. And it won't happen here either. We have to look elsewhere to see how we're going to grow our economy at 5%. So sure, let's have a debate about that. But it's not a question of retreating into some bygone past. It's a question of actually seeing how you can actually think through these questions in the future. In relation to the trauma that people are facing at UCT and other universities, it's a massive problem. But here we get a resource question. You know, the universities are under-resourced. I mean, Jonathan is right. The focus, I mean, I think there is a serious debate at the universities about how the universities have positioned themselves, how they haven't listened to students, how an offense education system needs to be debated in a democratic fashion. But at the end of the day, there's a much broader debate out here with regard to the nature of our politics, both private and public, which has to, which in fact, sadly, is not the politics that students had in the 1980s during the UDF period, which is a politics we need to actually re-kind re of cultivate in a new sense, a politics which is a broad politics, which imagines what a South Africa of a future would look like in a fundamental way. That was the greatness of that period, and we lost that for all sorts of reasons that, that I bemoan um, uh, for, for, you know, back then. 
in relation to the question of um, uh, uh, funding, if just go back to that your point point made about um, about uh, 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 future you know people actually putting back. Yeah, there are a whole range of imaginative things we can do. There are imaginative things we can do to ensure. Uh, and I think it's right. It's got to be not just fees, but obviously the rest. No point, no one, no point giving a, a poor student free fees when they're starving or when they're psychologically traumatized. These, this is a package deal. But then there are imaginative issues that you can deal with. I mean, you know, there's one suggestion, which is the idea that you actually use the 15 or 20 billion that we can raise to give everybody up to say seven, eight hundred thousand rands, maybe even more. Um, a, a free education for the first year and loan schemes only then uh, start um, gravitating after that because the prediction is that if you get through first year the chances of you actually graduating are much higher which means you will get a job and you will never be saddled with loans whereas first year it's a disaster that's one thought there's another thought which suggests that we do actually give people loans that can be written off quite easily um, for, for two or three years because we don't have the money at the moment, but that we reconvert the loan scheme to a, to, a, to a funding scheme thereafter because as our economy starts to climb out of its recession, we'll have more money available. So we should be having debates about various funding things. The one thing I can tell you is graduate taxes don't work. We've run the numbers. And the numbers show that you know, if you work it out each year, remember you need 40 to 50, and as you get graduates coming out for each year, you're only going to get two or three or four. So you can't use the graduate tax, it's, even if you wanted to. And I perfectly understand the generational problem about black students actually having extended families for which they have to pay for. But the graduate tax is, is a non-starter. We probably have like a few minutes left to close off. So I'm going to take one or two comments on the floor towards the report, towards the report. Over there, and then closing there. And then, Alan, I'm going to give you an opportunity. and. Uh, it's not Mr. Carolus, is it? Yes. It is Mr. Carolus, isn't it? So, uh, thank you. W would you guys mind if we extend this by five to ten minutes just? I need to go back yeah, Good, Judge. We can get you out by then. Uh, cut a long story short. Uh, we mentioned nothing about the blended learning. And uh, given all that we've said tonight, um, you know, what are the thoughts about us looking a lot more at blended learning, uh, giving students who don't have access, don't have finance, uh, opportunities through that space? Um, to Judge Davis, I'm sure you can lift some transparency for us now. Uh, the arithmetic of wealth tax. Now, for example, if, ben, if Warren Buffett dies, we know that there's $60 billion that he will give to charity. So we've got a figure there. Now, in South Africa, in your, in your studies, we talk a lot of the revenue stream of tax, if we move it from 40 to 60. But in your work with the Tax Commission, is there any clarity about if we ever talk of wealth tax, what is the wealth? Can we, is there a figure? Is it transparent? You know, is it enough? Um, is there any sort of idea that you can shed on that? Hi there. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking about the question of reimagining the economy of the university. You have teaching and learning and you have research. So why not have a commercial link to the university? Um, a business school can have a consulting firm. That firm will generate income that will be tax-free, that can be plowed into bursaries for students, um, engineering firms. The research that gets done can be implemented in a commercial space that will give greater integrity to the research aside from peer-reviewed journals, um, that it actually works and it's a viable commercial entity. So reimagining universities, having teaching and learning, research and commercial that will generate also jobs for students coming up. Um, they will gain that experience um, to go further in the economy and um, there will be revenue generation for the state from taxes from those those people who are employed. So just reimagine the university um, because it's a tax-free entity so 
Sweat the acid. Sweat the acid. Oh, you want to, okay, let me start uh, with the question of, of universities and the commercial side. I think a lot of the faculties are doing that right now, actually. Um, and there is money there, but it's not quite as much as you... You're not going to be able to... Gener you can generate for further bursaries, etc. Universities are actually in very terrible financial trouble at the moment. And thank are thinking of all sorts of schemes to do this. Uh, remember that universities are faced with uh, insourced uh, the salaries of, I'm not suggesting it was unjustifiable, not at all, but the, the, the non-academic staff salaries increased quite considerably. There's now great pressure for academic salaries to be increased as well. They've all said, you know, you gave the non-academic staff all these increases, we get nothing. Um, if you look at the UCT books, and I've I've had to advise a little bit on that. It's it's really in a very parlous state. So, sure, you can do that, and it'll help, but it's not going to be a solution. But you're dead right. Um, we're going to have to think more imaginatively about raising further funds. There's always a danger about doing that too much, because of the fact that you want your universities, critical for a growth of this economy, to have research universities. If you're going to have a knowledge economy, You've got to have proper research in a whole range of areas. And might I say, research which is located for the problems here, whether it be medicine, science, etc. I mean, we've got a water crisis in this particular province at the moment, as we all know. Now, the more research we have about how we solve that is really very critical. It's that kind of stuff we want. So you've got to get a balance right. But it is, a, it is certainly something universities have to deal with. In relation to blended learning, um, yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have to think about that too. But let me say this. It also comes back to the kind of students you're getting into a university. Because let's be honest, all the universities are having to have support programs. And you come back to the problem that uh, for all the reasons we've debated, not necessarily financial, we are not producing sufficient um, uh, uh, primary and secondary um, education standards which allow people to confidently get through. It's a disgrace. And we need to, we need to ref, you know, there are all sorts of debates we can have about why. But obviously, once you've got that problem, blended learning is a problem because the, more, the less a student has contact and support structures, the, 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 the more impoverished the student is going to become. And I certainly feel that after teaching for 40 years that that is so. I can notice that even with the students who don't come to my lectures, just how more poorly they do. Because they because don't have that interaction. So we've got to think it through, but it's only a part solution to the problem. In relation to the question of the wealth um, tax, it's extraordinarily difficult to know what the wealth of the country is. There are a series of reasons for that. Firstly, it goes back to questions of whether we've got sufficient information from SARS to be able to document that. You know, in other words, whether people are accurately reflecting their capital and the assets when they, when they in fact reflect on the tax returns, which clearly there's a big gaping hole there. Secondly, um, there's a huge amount of money which has been secreted out of the country illegally. Now, there are two things about that, I should say. Um, it's hard to know how much that is. Of course, I know that people will tell me that they've read all these studies about vast sums of money. I've gone through every single one of them, I can assure you. I've been on this tax commission for three and a half years. We've studied them all. And when you, when you test the numbers, none of those numbers are accurate. What we do know is that the most accurate numbers I was given was by some of the banks. So the Swiss banks reckon there's about 100 billion US dollars lurking around in Swiss banks, right? And, and there may be more elsewhere. Mauritius. You know, people poo-pooed the idea that they go to other African countries. Not true. Mauritius is growing like hell because people are relocating there because they have low tax rates, etc. And there's a lot of money into Mauritius. If I was the Minister of Finance, I'd cancel the double tax treaty with Mauritius tomorrow morning because it's a real problem for us. But, but what I'm saying is, I, I can't tell you how much there is there. There is a lot. Right? Now, one of the reasons that we did recommend a, a special um, voluntary disclosure program was not because I want to be deeply sympathetic to people who are crooked, not at all, but the point was I want to get the money in. So, for example, if we could get 10 or 15 or 20 billion in as a stream, because 
on the tax on the capital, well then some of the points that Anela has been raising of concern would certainly be more easily solved. We'd have more money for all these priorities. That did not work particularly well. Right? And it didn't work for two substantial reasons. One is I think SARS worked up too late and there are, as you know, significant questions around that institution. But there's also, and it's a deeply disturbing problem, there is a, an increasing lack of tax morality in South Africa today. Let us not kid ourselves. People are not paying tax the way they did. You know, it's interesting, in Sweden, they budget for 100, they got 110. They got more than they budgeted for. They had to give back money because people actually have a commitment to, to their society. We, not, we don't have that. And it's a really worrying problem and it's got worse. So, and then thirdly, you've got to have a national director of public prosecutions and an office which is going to prosecute people who are illegally evading tax. You open up your newspaper every day, the Daily Maverick, etc., you read about this. Can you tell me anybody's been prosecuted? People have lavish weddings and they recycle money to Dubai and elsewhere. Nobody seems to care a damn. So all of those issues are making us hemorrhage in the significance of money. And finally, if you ask me how much is there available, the only thing we can do is try to work out what is the comparative situation in other countries that have tried wealth taxes? And then look at the percentage that they collect and try to take the highest percentage of that and then work out what it is. And really, it's probably if we get between 5 to 10 billion, that would be a huge amount. Right? We would be very successful by international standards. So that's the best I can, I can tell you. Thanks. We're still working on it. Sorry. Thank, thanks. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you to wrap up first, Anella, in about three minutes. Yeah. Um, I think Judge Dennis Davis has said a majority of the things that I would contribute. Um, but I'm not necessarily tax proficient, so I don't think I can engage with that question as extensively as, as needed, right? But on the issue of blended learning, as a student who had to undergo blended learning during the protest period, one thing that I definitely will tell you is that it is very troublesome for learning outcomes, number one, right? In the sense that a lot of the content, when you try to teach somebody something, you need to ensure that it's understood, right? There's certain language that you use, there's certain imagery that you use, maybe podcasts, maybe examples that you can give, but also the, the access to the lecturer is an important issue because when we digitalize everything, it becomes an issue for students who come into the university environment and are not necessarily the most literate right or they don't speak english that well and now they have to deal with the fact that there's all of these sources that they have to access and have to read and have to do everything on their own and i mean essentially you're then turning a a student in a you know a, a daytime university into a unisa student and in that case then why am i not going to unisa because i could be a working professional whilst i'm getting a degree that is a double advantage for anybody but the problem is is that not enough recognition is given to UNISA students, right? The job market ultimately dictates um, the kind of professions that a lot of students go into and who actually gets hired. So even with the, the, the report, for instance, that's been uh, released about the credibility of LLB degrees, where UCT has been notified that, you know, uh, we lack transformation in the LLB degree. Uh, it's, it's, it's an issue because private firms and institutions that hire LLB students have still come out to say that even in the face of a lack of a transformation that has been noted by this institution, they're still our preferred graduates. And so the, the old boys club and these kind of systems that maintain themselves are still an issue, right? And they need, they need serious attention. Secondly, the issue with blended learning is things about access. I mean, when we talk about access to, to a computer, for instance, access to Wi-Fi, access to, you know, printing and, and measures like that, but also what happens to students with learning disabilities, right? Lecture halls are equipped to support students perhaps who have hearing disabilities, speech impediments. When we apply blended learning, it then becomes very difficult now because then those students have to outsource 
source individually the people who would assist in those kind of um, activities. Um, and I think that when we consider blended learning as part of the solution, I actually don't think in practice it has shown any fruit. And even as a person, let's say myself, who came out of high school actually understanding English and being able to write proficiently, I really struggled with blended learning and that reflected in my results. So it's not only for the disadvantaged students, but imagine the intensity it's felt at by students who are already walking into the situation disadvantaged. One, right? one, one minute. Um, and you know, the thing about reimagining the university uh, space is, is a, a very complex one, right? Um, Judge Dennis Davis has already mentioned a majority of the things that I would say, but again, I'd like to reemphasize that the workplace ultimately determines the, the demand for the kind of student that gets hired. And that's the unfortunate part because there's not enough engagement with those workforces and the creation of employment and to say, how can we diversify the kind of students and the skill sets that actually get to be employed, right? But there's also not enough engagement with the greater community in the sense that this discussion has only been centered around the state. It's been centered around the, the, the private sector or banking institutions. But what is the community's role in this, right? So for instance, um, the lady mentioned earlier about the deficit in psychological avenues for students to access. There are lots of qualified psychologists in and around Cape Town, but none of them are actually offering their services to help out in, 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 in the university structures where there is a lack right, at a reduced rate even for students knowing that they can't afford it. So I think an appeal has to be made to the greater community to say that if you actually have a skill set that you could use, that you could benefit other people with, I think that it's our role and responsibility to actually contribute to that instead of waiting for a big program where somebody creates a charity or creates community service for us to actually participate. What onus then do we bear to actually offer our services as people who've graduated and have made it through and have made our lives successful to actually offer our services to helping out in this regard? And I think that conversation also needs to be had with the community at large just generally. Thank, thank you, Anella. Thank, thank you very much. So we, we conclude and as a friend of ours would say, uh, judge for yourself. So thank you very much, Judge Davis. Thank you, Anella. I'm just going to ask my CEO to close for us two minutes and just to give you a small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, could we have the gift and Rudy will hand over the gift to the two speakers. Um, Anela. Do you the same thing I brought up? <laughs> no, 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 not a voucher, <laughs> don't worry. It's, uh, that's something which we, we think will find you <laughs> full. So Anela, you've really given us uh, food for thought and I really appreciate you joining us. It's such short notice. Mm -hmm. You've really taken the conversation as far as I'm concerned to another dimension and really made me think about a whole range of things in relation to, to this report and all the other uh, things that we've spoken about this evening. And then, Dennis, you always, always rise to the occasion. And I think one of the one of the statements that will stay with me, but not so much what has to fall, it's what has to rise. And I think, Dennis, when you said that, that it's almost the penny drop that we felt, that there's certainly a whole lot of work for us to do. At Cornerstone, people will be committed to continue this, this conversation, to continue to be engaged in a series of critical dialogue, we want to invite you to our Festival of Learning, which happens from the 4th to the 9th of December. Diarise that date. We've got a couple of uh, save the date uh, flyers as you leave. Please collect one so you put it into your diary. We've got a range of exciting uh, topics that we're dealing with. Our theme this year is Healing the World. Um, very ambitious, uh, but we're on that road, aren't we, together? Um, so we have uh, quite a bit of input from our own faculty and what we will undertake to do is to uh, share that program with you. Uh, it culminates in an open day on the 9th of December with some live music at the market. So there's also a lot of fun that we've got lined up for the, for the sort of final big bash that we have around learning and celebrating learning and being together in spaces like this. Thank you for coming into our space again. You know that this space is your space. 
and we want you to always feel that you can come and engage with us at any time that you would like to, because we here for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.